Dr. Sylvie Stacy is a preventative medicine physician and the founder of the blog LookingForZebras.com. You're a doctor, so you get the reference, and in this situation, the zebra is a non-clinical career. Now, she knew from the start that she wanted to be a non-clinical physician, but there weren't many resources out there, so for others going through the same experience, she built her blog. And she just wrote the book, 50 Non-Clinical Careers for Physicians, Fulfilling Meaningful and Lucrative Alternatives to Direct Patient Care. On today's podcast, she shares with us some of the more common, some of the less common, some of the more lucrative, and some of the more unexpected opportunities that are out there and how to find them. Dr. Stacy received her medical degree from UMass Medical School and completed residency at Johns Hopkins, where she earned an MPH. Since then, her work has mainly involved correctional health care, addiction medicine, medical writing, and utilization management. What ties all of her work experience together is the goal of helping organizations offer services and products that are rooted in evidence-based medicine. She went from a first-year medical student thinking that she'd made the absolute worst mistake of her life to a happily practicing physician with unrelenting enthusiasm about all the opportunities in and out of medicine. So check out her book and check out her blog and stay tuned for the interview. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Sylvie Stacy, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Brad. It's good to be here. So how did you decide to go into non-clinical medicine? How did you arrive at that decision? And then from that decision, uh, take us on your career path a little, and then how did that evolve into a book, a blog, and then a book? Sure. Uh, So I started thinking about non-clinical careers way back when I was a first-year medical student. As soon as they started exposing us as students to the clinical setting, there were aspects of it that I liked, but I realized very early on, I just didn't see myself being in a clinical setting, seeing patients, patient after patient, day after day. It seemed like it would be really exhausting for me and uh, not really fulfilling. And so I started thinking about what are the broader ways that I might be able to use my medical degree. Because even as a first year student, I felt like I was too far along to possibly turn around and take another career path. And I I liked the science of medicine. I liked being in the classroom, learning about uh, medicine and and the science behind it. So so I kept going and just kind of kept my ears and eyes peeled for uh, for sort of unconventional things that that physicians were doing with their careers. And well, how did you know how did you know you didn't want to be in maybe a non-patient facing specialty like like a radiologist or a pathologist, right? Someone who doesn't interact with patients very much. How did you know you wanted to leave the clinical realm completely? So I didn't. And actually, radiology and pathology were the two top contenders for <laughs> my specialty choice, in addition to preventive medicine. And I did end up pursuing preventive medicine, but definitely those non-patient-facing specialties were at the top of my list as well. And in my exploring of, of all the, the different things that I could do with preventive medicine training, I decided that that just, um, that had the widest range of options. And I, I loved the idea of trying to promote health and prevent disease in an entire community or population of patients at once rather than just individual patients. And so that was really the deciding factor for me. What is preventative medicine? Because it's something that I... I've actually never been exposed to. Yeah, it's not well advertised in medical school. And and I think that's because so many physicians that go into preventive medicine end up in careers that aren't in your traditional patient care settings like hospitals and outpatient clinics. Many of them take jobs at uh, departments of health or with the federal government with health and human services or in various types of non-clinical careers, such as with a, a health insurance company. So you don't find them in the traditional settings that you do most other doctors. And so word just has not gotten out quite as much. And there simply aren't as many programs because they have a different funding mechanism than, than most specialties. They're not primarily funding. Is there a residency? 
There is, yeah. It's, it's um, a, an ABMS recognized board certification, just like all the rest of them. But its funding doesn't come mainly from Medicare. Like right, the you're other not residency. billing patients. Right, correct. So how does that work? What is a what is the residency? Pro- I know this. I'm sorry, this is a different direction than we were going to take this, but I, I still I think it's really interesting. Just because I'm sure most of us are just. Like you said, uh, preventive medicine has a PR problem. We're, we're just not aware of it. So, <laughs> so what did residency look like, or at least look like for you? So I did a transitional year internship, which is the same as anyone else who does a transitional year. It's primarily clinical, rotating through a lot of internal medicine and surgery on the wards, but then also some elective rotations like uh, radiology and ophthalmology and whatnot. So that's the first year. And then there are two more years that are basically doing medicine in the setting of public health. And you do that by rotating through various settings in which physicians are are needed to either determine health policy or take leadership positions over healthcare organizations and use epidemiology and statistics to help guide community or population-wide healthcare decisions. So personally, I, I rotated through a consulting firm, the Food and Drug Administration, a pharmaceutical company, and gosh, I'm trying to recall what else. Oh, a, a managed care company. So a pretty wide assortment of areas um, that oftentimes hire non-clinical physicians. So that was that was really what opened my eyes to all of the different types of non-clinical careers that physicians can take. And and many of these jobs aren't specifically for preventive medicine physicians. It just so happens that that's the path that many preventive medicine physicians take. But really, doctors of any specialty are great candidates for a lot of these roles at companies that are in industries and sectors outside of, of hospitals and healthcare systems. Yeah. And, and you, I think all of those you hit in your book, Yes. Yep. So uh, several of the careers in my book I've I've touched on in my own career at some point, either in a full-time job or uh, doing a, a little freelance work or a side hustle or through one of my rotations during residency. Many of them I also have no exposure to and and went out and found physicians to talk to and got some, some good interviews to give that perspective as well. So where has your career Tell us a bit about your career trajectory. So during residency, as I mentioned, I rotated through a very varied selection of, of companies and, and types of responsibilities that uh, a physician can have outside of clinical work. And I really loved every aspect of it. I, I liked doing health policy development and um, health education. I liked doing utilization management. I liked clinical informatics. And I really had trouble narrowing it down. Whereas in medical school, it was so easy for me to cross off different specialties that I didn't (laughs) want to do. I knew I didn't want to be a pediatrician. I didn't want to be a family physician. I didn't want to be a surgeon. And I was, I ended up going with what I was left with. Well, in residency, it was like I kept adding things to my list and I had a tough time deciding really where I wanted to take my career. Uh, So what I ended up doing was taking a medical director position with a healthcare company that provides healthcare services at prisons and jails. And so I I oversaw the clinical services they were providing at all of their contracted jails, which really involved a lot of the things that I just mentioned that I loved. So there was a utilization management aspect, and I helped them develop an EHR for their patients, and I helped educate the providers out at the jail sites. So I ended up being able to combine all of those things into this really interesting job that um, that helped ensure that that our patients in the jails were were getting strong healthcare. Wow. So I'm guessing that social justice is also something that is uh, important to you. To some extent, yes. So so then, how did you decide to start blogging about this? I mean, how did you realize that there was a need aside from the fact that? It was apparent to you that preventative medicine had had a, had that PR problem, and a, and a blog would help. How did you decide to start blogging, and then how did that evolve into a book? I, in addition to to that job that I described, uh, have always liked doing uh, some work on the side, a side gig, if you will. So that has involved some medical writing and and some other part time or consulting work, and I felt that those were such great uses of the medical knowledge that I had gained through my training. And they can be 
great experience builders and good sources of extra income. And I found uh, colleagues and friends asking me, how do, you, how do you come across all of these opportunities? And I started to see a need for information about both how do you find interesting, interesting ways to use your medical training and how do you find work that's truly fulfilling and what are the options for physicians outside of traditional settings? It, it seemed like my fellow physicians, many weren't aware of all the options or they felt like they were stuck in their careers somehow. Um, and looking for information myself, it, it seems to be pretty limited. So I decided to start this blog focusing on how to find fulfillment and satisfaction in your career as a physician, going beyond just treating patients, but ju just really getting the most out of our degrees and all we have to offer to, to patients and populations. And I ended up calling it Look for Zebras. And you probably recall from your own training, there's a phrase that's commonly used which is yep when you hear hoofbeats don't look for yeah don't look for zebras look for horses exactly yes and so we're all busy looking for horses and you're telling us in fact if you're not so happy or and not so fulfilled maybe it's time to start looking for zebras exactly yep when it comes to patients it's fine to look for for horses and your diagnoses but when it comes to your career be on the lookout for for opportunities that are truly a good fit for your interests and in your passions in and outside of medicine, be on the lookout for them and be open to them when they come along because a zebra career will just leave you so much more satisfied in life in the long run and on a day-to-day -day basis than a horse career. And, and I think also, you know, it wasn't until I made this foray into social media uh, because of the podcast that I realized how many doctors out there are looking for side hustles. Because for a lot of these, you don't necessarily need to leave your career full-time seeing patients. They're, these are ways to, there are ways to dip your toes in that can be more fulfilling, adding another dimension to what you do. And, and there's such a desire. I keep hearing side gigs, side hustle. Like, well, you would think we'd go through all this work and all this training that we'd be like, all right, I'm 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 satisfied. I'm satisfied. Um, but it, it you know it happened to me when I you know, after finishing college and then doing medical school and then doing residency, I, I joined my practice and you know I'm still convinced that this is the practice that I'm going to be with until I retire. But I saw my exam rooms and I was like, so these are the exam rooms where I'm going to be for the next 35 years, huh? Like <laughs> that's uh, okay. So I, I mean I totally understand what you said at the beginning that like you saw patients. And you're like, oh man, I just can't see myself doing this all day. Like I had that moment when I saw my exam rooms and was, had the same, so 35, 40 years, same rooms. Okay. After making the like exactly. jump after a few years, you know, it's a different thing. Yeah. So, so, and I, and I think, I think also this, this helps with burnout uh, because it just makes, you know, makes something a little more something new like there's there's this hedonic adaptation to doing the same things over and over and over and seeing the same pathologies over and Absolutely. over and over and and mm -hmm. adding another dimension to who you are and what you do is is going to make that a little more yep and help with that, that hedonic adaptation yeah, yeah so giving but, a different perspective to what you do on a daily basis and i yeah. will say there there's a lot to be said for having a regular full-time job with a salary and benefits and getting that regular paycheck every two weeks. That's, that, that's wonderful. But I, I do think for, for a lot of physicians, after going through so many years of training and having so much knowledge to be able to, to put to use, there is this drive to do something else outside of that main full-time job. And for many reasons, both because it's interesting, because it can help you reach financial independence sooner, because you can help more people. It just, it really adds, like you said, that new dimension to your career. We're seeing one patient at a time. We're helping one patient at a time. Whereas in the careers you discuss, you can be helping hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients at a time. So you really can end up mm -hmm. having having more of, of an impact. But, but, you know, that is, that can be frowned upon right? Leaving clinical medicine, 
jumping off that moving train. So what would you say to someone who's thinking about leaving clinical medicine, but they're worried about what others are going to think about them? You stop seeing patients? Like, Mm. how would you counsel them? So I am a worrier myself. I understand why that thought process happens, but I can say that as much as possible, it's really not worth the worry. It's not worth taking a lot of time to consider what others are going to think about the the path that you take with your career. I think that just everyone has an opinion about everything, especially regarding life choices that are different from what they've personally done. So I I recall a time in medical school, uh, I had an attending anesthesiologist talking to me and one of my classmates about what specialty we were considering. And my classmate mentioned family medicine and the attending said, well, sure, do that if you want your life to be a wasteland. And then I had another conversation with a generalist who was mocking the subspecialization of ophthalmologists, saying how ridiculous it was that he couldn't just make a referral to an ophthalmologist. He had to make a referral to someone who was subspecialized in a single eye chamber or a certain membrane of the eye. So, oh, yeah, I had we have an episode called What Weighs an Ounce and Has Eight Fellowships. (laughs) That's that's the eyeball. So, uh, yeah, so that's that's. Spot on. Uh, yeah, I can I can understand that. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying that that like it's pointing out their own insecurity, really. Mm-hmm. Like if they're saying that like you're you've got this exciting different career that they've never even considered as an option, nor would they be bold enough to try it even if they had. If they're saying things that that are making you uneasy, it's 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 probably from their own place of insecurity. That could be, or sometimes just a a simple misunderstanding or a lack of knowledge about what physicians in non-clinical positions do. They may not realize the extent to which a doctor working for a pharmaceutical company or a consulting firm or another type of organization really depends on their clinical experience and their medical knowledge to do their job and the extent to which their job at that organization at some point downstream influences the clinical physician's uh, decision-making and the way that they care for their patients. So let's talk about that. How important is residency, like a um, a clinical residency? Let's say you have someone who, um, like you, right? They're in medical school. They know that they don't want to do something patient-facing. They want a, a non-clinical career, or they're considering it. They haven't really, they're not really totally sold on it yet. How valuable is doing, say, an internal medicine residency or a family medicine, you know, some generalist type type residency, and then maybe even some post-training clinical experience. How often are, um, or is it where the job is looking for someone that has residency training with or without post-training clinical experience? Yeah, so this is a question I thought long and hard about as a medical student. So I mentioned that I thought about pathology and radiology and preventive medicine, but I also thought a lot about not doing a residency at all, just because I, I felt so strongly that I didn't want to practice medicine very much. And I knew, as every medical student does, that completing an internship and a residency is a, is a tough thing to do, and the pay is very low. So I, I asked a lot of physicians about their opinion on that. And the overwhelming response was do a residency. And that advice came from both clinical and non-clinical physicians. And so now I've done a residency and I'm in the workforce. I've been here for a while and I definitely agree with that advice that I got. I think that doing a residency and being board certified carries a lot of weight as a physician. It truly does open up doors for you for many types of non-clinical jobs, even if the work doesn't involve actually uh, managing patients and practicing medicine. And additionally, we all change our minds from, from time to time. If you decide later that you do want to do clinical medicine, having done a residency is huge because it's difficult to go back and, and do one later. I know for me, I did kind of end up changing my mind. I've never seen patients exclusively as a full-time job, but I ended up having a clinical component as part of my first job out of residency, and I've continued to do part-time clinical work since then. And honestly, I didn't anticipate that that would be the case, but I'm really happy with the way that it, it turned out. So I think it's important to look at the big picture when it comes to your career. So residency is just three to six years out of a career that will probably last for decades. What would you say to residents listening to the podcast 
who are in the middle of training and feeling some despair. I, I remember being that resident mm-hmm. and my co-residents, Roberta and Melissa, <laughs> if you're listening right now, there were plenty of times, you better be, uh, th- there were plenty of times where we would turn to each other and say, we're quitting, mm-hmm. right? We're quitting, we're quitting. When are we quitting? Are we going to quit now? Is this, we're just going to quit? We're going to start working at Starbucks? Like when are we, because we were just, there were, you know, there were, there were many, many low points in residency where we're just, you know, feeling like you shouldn't be there. You don't deserve to be there. You're tired of feeling this way. You're tired of being beaten down. Mm-hmm. You're broken. You're ready to quit, right? Yes. And so the, 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 the non-clinical career then looks very appealing, right? What would you say to those residents, right? They're ready to jump off the moving train and just change paths. What, what would you say to them? Well, first I'd say, if you can, just suck it up and finish. And I wish that didn't have to be the case, but I think for a lot of people, it is worth finishing, even if they're not happy, as long as it's not reaching the point where they're truly like, depressed or mentally unstable, but if they can tolerate it, just finish. And to make that easier, at at least to the extent possible, I'd say try to expand your view of how you can use your training and experience. If you're burned out and dissatisfied in a clinical setting, it may just have a lot to do with spending all day every day in that same setting and being surrounded by other people who are clinicians. And you start to think that that's all there is to life. But I think that many residents simply need to be rest assured that there are many other options and it it can be tough to gain exposure to different options for non-clinical work because they are so varied and they cover so many different industries and organization types. uh, And most residents don't get to do rotations in them during their training. So one of the best things that you can do is just start learning about those options, either by reading or getting introductions to doctors and in various roles that sound interesting to you. And then use that new information as motivation to to carry you through the rest of your training. And, and, you know, there are all sorts of elective opportunities as well. So you can open your eyes and start looking outside the box for different opportunities. I know during my third year, I did a we're all required to do research and do a research project. And if if I were able to, at the time, come up with something creative enough and outside the box enough, I'm sure my program would have been game with it as long as I I could have really produced something from it. They knew it would have been a fulfilling experience and, you know, maybe something publishable. Um, But I ended up just doing bench research in the lab, which was nothing that I would ever utilize, nothing that I ever even wanted to do. It was just more like, (laughs) And you know, that's a great point. If if you have that opportunity, take advantage of it. And it does require effort and planning to to produce something that your program is going to agree to. But if you you're not happy in residency and feeling some despair, it's worth putting in that time and effort to give yourself exposure to something else that you may be more passionate about. And and I'm sure it's it's not an uncommon thing in residency programs. I, I have pediatric residents that rotate with me. And that was born of me just going to the hospital and rounding and one day the residents were like, can we just like spend two weeks with him in the office? And that that was the, then now, you know, every year I get a couple of, of pediatric residents that spend two years learning about ENT, which I think is hugely important mm-hmm. for, for pediatricians. But like, you know, they were, they thought a little outside the box. Like, wh- what about him? Like, and you can, you can do that. And I think also that that helps with that, that hedonic adaptation. Like you mm-hmm. start noticing all the different colors in the trees and you're, you know, like, you know, when you when you're when you're thinking, what are the ways that I can do things differently? Um, so, but, absolutely. Okay. Well, let's let's. What about someone who's already practicing clinical medicine? Okay, and they just want to get out. Like they don't know what they're going to do. They don't want they 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 they're waiting for your book to arrive. Right? They've decided. They just I've got I can't do this anymore. I've got to get out. They haven't figured out what they want to do with their life now, what their career now. So they're like, I'll just bide my time with a graduate degree. So first, what what degrees out there? Because right, M- you can get an MBA, you can get an MPH. Um, there was someone at my medical school who had an MMM, which is I think a master's in medical management. You can get a JD. So lots of different degrees. Are there any that you're familiar with that I didn't mention? Is there? What, and what are your thoughts on? more school. Yeah. Um, the ones that you mentioned are the, the main ones that physicians seem to get. Uh, the MMM is also very similar to 
and master's of healthcare management. And there's some similar ones to that, but basically a, a master's focusing on management within the, the healthcare space. And I think that any of these graduate degrees can be valuable. Uh, it's rare to see a non-clinical job opportunity in which a master's degree, such as an MBA or an MPH, is required. And some jobs, job ads will will state that one of those degrees is preferable, but oftentimes relevant experience carries just as much weight, if not more weight. Uh, and additionally, in most cases of physicians transitioning from clinical medicine to non-clinical work, a master's degree won't significantly increase your compensation. So I, I wouldn't advise that any doctors pursue a degree just to help them get a non-clinical job. Uh, but the question you posed was more about a, a physician who is not sure what they want to do. And I think in that case, uh, an MBA or an MPH or an MMM is certainly something to consider. Um, many programs allow you to either do those part-time or they have accelerated programs that allow you to get a degree in sometimes less than a year. So if you're willing to put in some nights and weekends or take a year off from your current job, it can be a great way to, to really uh, delve into what your next career step is. Um, and, and for any physicians, even if they do have an idea of what it is they wanna do when it comes to non-clinical jobs, if they have a, a deep interest in either business or public health or healthcare management or any other area, I think that degree can really increase their knowledge base, help them grow their network and give them exposure to different fields and sectors aside from the clinical settings that they're used to. So sometimes, right, those those physicians that decide to leave clinical medicine or maybe mostly leave clinical medicine, right? They keep their foot in the door, maybe seeing patients one day a week. They get one of these master's degrees. They become hospital administrators, right? How do you avoid mm -hmm. becoming one of, quote, them, right? Like, it seems to be that there's always this this push and pull between the administrators and the clinical physicians. And, how, you know, like, and, and you mentioned it in your book, right? You, 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 there's the thought of like selling out, right? How do you, you know, stay, how, how do you stay one of us, right? As opposed to the, what is viewed by the, the patient facing physicians as them. Sure. Yeah. So I, I actually start off the, the book or somewhere near the beginning of the book. I, I tell readers that as a physician, your profession is always medicine. That holds true regardless of whether you spend your career seeing patients or doing other things in another work environment. If you have an MD or a DO, you're a doctor. And that means that we can always use those principles and values that we're taught which are to ab abide by ethical standards, to not do harm, to respect patients, and so on. We can continue to do those things for a drug company or for an insurance company or as a healthcare executive or for, a head of, for the federal government or, or any type of organization. So I think that just keeping that mindset is important. Uh, keeping that mindset that we had when we were first applying to medical school way back in the day, that mindset of just wanting to do good and help people. And in fact, most physicians who are hired for non-clinical roles are hired specifically for their medical expertise and the input that they can provide from a clinical perspective. So they're hired for their knowledge of how to manage diseases and patients. And so it's part of their job to not be one of them, but to provide that clinical and medical perspective. So I think it's definitely possible to do a non-clinical job in a way that helps to carry out this, the strategy of, of a company and help them stay profitable or accomplish their mission, but also to do what's best ultimately for patients and the general public and to do it in a way that has uh, the best interests of the, the healthcare industry and patients in mind. So we haven't really gotten into the different career. I mean, you mentioned them at the beginning for your path and your exposure during your training, but you know, we mentioned also the, the PR problem with the preventative medicine. What are some of the non-clinical careers that maybe also have a PR problem? Like when you talk to other physicians and they, they answer is, 
wow, I never considered that. I never even heard of that. I like, so what are the less common non-clinical careers out there that you discuss in your book? Surprise us. Oh, there's some good ones. <laughs> uh, so one that I love telling physicians about is drug safety. So it's very common for a physician who is considering non-clinical careers to at least think about the pharmaceutical industry. And for most doctors, when they think about working in pharma, they think about research and development in a role such as a medical monitor for clinical trials. But drug safety and pharmacovigilance is a really important aspect of the post-approval phase of a drug's life cycle. Uh, so pharma companies depend heavily on doctors with clinical backgrounds and usually with residency training to review safety reports and determine what issues are a potential safety issue related to the drug versus events that happen for other because of other factors. And drug safety has always struck me as one of the neatest non-clinical jobs because it truly does depend on you using your medical background and your problem solving skills in a kind of similar way that you do clinically, but for that whole population of patients, again, and instead of individuals and in a different setting that, that tends to have uh, more flexibility and somewhat less stress than a clinical setting. So basically you're trying to diagnose the problem, right? So uh, a patient has a side effect. You have to say, was it the drug? Was it not the drug? Right. Yep. That's the general gist of it. Uh, so that's one less commonly known, but fairly easy to come by uh, non-clinical career. There are some of the, there are some less commonly known careers where the opportunities really are few and far between, but they are really interesting. So one example is one of the, one of the physicians I interviewed for the book, Dr. Michael Crupain. He is the medical unit chief of staff for the Dr. Oz show. Yes. And he's also worked for Consumer Reports and for the Discovery Channel. And his job just sounds incredibly interesting. Uh, and there are, there are certainly opportunities for physicians in various areas of media and entertainment, but you really do need to seek them out. And in many cases, you need to be open to living in a big city like New York or LA if you wanna work with some of the big names or have a lot of Hey, I already live in New York. Oh, perfect. That's then, great. <laughs> just find a TV Halfway show. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think for, for those- Are there any people creators, listening that are interested in hiring me to be <laughs> either on their TV show or just reviewing it for medical accuracy, I'm, I'm available. Yeah, and, I'm and available. those I'm expensive, sound like really interesting side gigs too. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that, that I haven't mentioned is that the book really does focus on full-time career opportunities, but a lot of them are available as consulting work or, or side gig opportunities as well for physicians that may want to keep their clinical careers. So I, I do think there's those opportunities in media and entertainment as well. You just really do have to be proactive about looking out for those opportunities. Those are the zebras that you have to be on the lookout. Yeah, I wonder how often they're just, it's just like a writer who whose roommate in college ended up going to medical school and they're like, hey, do you want to work on my show? Versus like, you know, they put a application out on LinkedIn or monster.com. Right. Yeah. I bet it's more of the former. More connections. Particular job yeah, type. Yeah. But then other, uh, other non-clinical careers like those in utilization management, opportunities with managed care companies and many opportunities with pharmaceutical companies, those are out there and they're posted on the internet and you can go find the, the job ad and you can apply and it's that simple. So I think that finding the perfect non-clinical career fit is often a combination of searching yourself through what's publicly available and using your network and making it known what it is that you want to do with your career. One of the more helpful aspects in your book is you you have this gauge with different careers that shows you the mean income for a primary care physician, and it gives you a range around there that shows the overlap or lack thereof with the income for the non-clinical career relative to that in that that primary care uh, income. Now, there are physicians out there in more lucrative specialties like orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, uh, anesthesiology, right, uh, urology, ophthalmology, any, any of the surgical subs, um, where they might feel like they are wearing these golden handcuffs. And, and right, they've gotten themselves into that situation because of their spending. But Right. Still, they, they have these high incomes and they feel like they can't leave because of that. So 
are there what are the more lucrative jobs out there if, if you have someone in that situation that's not willing to forego quite so much of, of their income? Are there really any out there aside from, you know, knowing someone in Hollywood? There are some lucrative ones out there. And I would say the, the most lucrative non-clinical jobs tend to be those in which your specialty training is required. So there are op- non-clinical opportunities specifically for physicians that have ophthalmology training or urology training or any of the specialties that you mentioned. Uh, oftentimes, they tend to be with pharmaceutical companies that are focused on that therapeutic area or health insurance companies that need clinical reviewers within those specialties. But if they need someone with the ability to think about clinical scenarios at the same level of detail as as a physician who's practicing clinically, they need to be willing to pay for it. And in many cases, they are. So if there's an organization who needs a subspecialist, it will, at least to some extent, compete with, with what someone can earn in a clinical setting. So that's one thing for those who are already in high paying specialties. For them, as well as any other physicians looking at non-clinical work, there are some opportunities that tend to start out at, with compensations that, that are lower than clinical work, but then have a great deal of opportunity for promotion and compensation increases. So that's especially true in management consulting and in the finance industry, though sometimes those can be difficult to get your foot in the door. So I think that for many physicians, if they are truly wanting a non-clinical job, they may consider other benefits aside from the salary itself. Many non-clinical jobs, they have regular hours. There's no on-call requirement. There's no weekend work requirement. They don't have the malpractice risk associated with patient care. And some jobs can even be done remotely or have flexible schedules. And generally, they tend to be lower stress than clinical jobs and in work cultures that are generally less hectic than at a hospital. Some physicians may be willing to give up some amount of their salary in order for some of those changes that give them a better work-life balance and a greater sense of happiness in the long run. Although if if you're going to start out in something like management consulting, like the management consulting, and, and I would imagine finance similarly, sometimes those are also really rigorous, right? They, they expect you to travel a lot to, to the places that they're consulting and, you know, they're they continue to work hard. So Absolutely, um, yeah. I think that's that's, yeah, a good that's point. something to consider as well. Any any parting words for our listeners? Um, if they are out there and in their jobs, finding them a little mundane, finding them a little stressful, finding them a little unfulfilling, and they're noodling around with the idea of, of a non-clinical career or at least a non-clinical side hustle. Uh, what, would you have any parting words for them? I would say rest assured that... Buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yes. And um, rest assured that you're not w- wasting all of the training that you've been through. You'll still get plenty of, of use out of it with, with a non-clinical role. And, and there is probably something out there that is a perfect fit for you uh, through which you'll truly find satisfaction. So keep at it. Excellent. Dr. Sylvie Stacy. thanks you so much for your time. The book is 50 Non-Clinical Careers for Physicians and available for purchase as of uh, a few weeks ago on lookforzebras.com. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.